What's up, everybody? Welcome to Move the Sticks Super Bowl week here. Uh, Bucky and myself excited to uh, to jump in talking about these two teams here with the Eagles and the Chiefs, which we're going to do momentarily. Uh, also going to recap what we saw at All-Star Games that we were at. Bucky doing a great job there with Rhett and company, even though you guys couldn't give me a touchdown, really, one touchdown. I mean, one touchdown. <laughs> Come on, man. Defensive. One it was a defensive, defensive showcase. It was great. It was great. I think we, I, great I think we only had maybe two. I think we only had maybe two in the senior bowl. But I, it, halfway through the second quarter, we hadn't scored a touchdown yet. I was like, oh, man, um, we got – come on, man. We got to get a yeah. touchdown. How you doing, bud? It's so funny. Man, I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, good to be back here. And, you know, I think we get a chance now because the draft is really coming up on us. Like, DJ, what's so crazy is um, we're going to do the Super Bowl. I'm going to go down to New Orleans and do the HBC Legacy Bowl. I come nice. right back and we go to the combine. And so, yeah. like – the way the season has stretched out, the combine kind of sneaks right up on you. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, it's, the, it's the Super Bowl, then two weeks later, literally we're in Indianapolis, and the new format uh, just kind of changes everything. So I'm kind of hustling uh, backwards to make sure that I get the top five list. I think I have to do that by Valentine's Day. So I'm, I'm on that. I'm digging <laughs> into, like, uh, the position stuff and kind of getting, you know, we talk about the neighborhood and, the houses and all that. So yeah. I'm trying to get that stuff kind of situated for that initial list. But I'm going to tell you, man, that it's a really interesting draft. And I know we'll get into it. Um, I would say like a lot of B's and B pluses, yeah. maybe not as many A's as we're accustomed to seeing. And so that, that'd be interesting how teams attack the board um, with that in mind. And because to me, and I'm just, you know, trying to get my arms around this. And I, I, I like, I'm like you. I feel like I'm so far behind. But when I looked at the combine, I was like, wait a second, what day is it? Oh man, I got a lot of guys to watch to get done. But I feel like this year, because I don't think that there's the high end, high end, and I don't think there's a lot mm -hmm. of separation between guys. I, th I think we'll have more. I'm just speaking personally. I think I'll have more movement and fluctuation on my list through the spring than maybe I ever mm -hmm. have. And, I, and you know, we always say, look, you know, just the best thing you can do is go off what you see on the tape, put it to bed, like don't get caught up in the fog of confusion here in the spring. However, when you have so many guys equally graded, like what we see mm -hmm. from these guys in the spring, what we find out from talking to buddies around the league about how they're interviewing and, and interacting in the background on these guys, I think because of that, it's going to be tiebreakers this year. You'll see more movement in the spring than maybe you've ever seen. And so one of the things that we love to do is the cluster buster, right? Where you put yeah. a group of players that are similarly graded, put them together and kind of hash out those conversations. DJ, it will be more fluid throughout the course of the spring because there are so many guys that are right there. And um, depending upon what you like, you know, there, some teams are about bigger, faster, stronger. There are other teams that production plays a huge role in that. And so, uh, It'd be interesting, like, because I know people sometimes take mock drafts for how we really view players as opposed to, hey, it's an exercise in terms yeah. of what we hear, what we think, teams think about these guys. Uh, when we get to these lists, top 50s, top fives, and begin to kind of go through these exercises, it's going to be different. And I think if you put a bunch of different evaluators in a room, you have a bunch of different opinions on how we should go from one to 150, like most teams do on the draft board. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting spring. And, man, it's uh, definitely catch-up mode, which seems weird because we didn't have as many juniors. So you would think we have mm -hmm. more of a handle on it. But, Buck, there's so many of these guys out. Just just putting the board together for the Senior Bowl, and we'll get to this All-Star game. We'll talk about some of these individual players a little bit later on in the show. But, Buck, you're going through the – you're going through the background, and it's like he played in 63 games. He started 54 mm -hmm. games. I'm like, good Lord, how long have these dudes been in college, man? But we've got some of these six, seven-year guys because of the COVID year. So, um, it's anyways, it's it's going to be, I think, for the next couple of years, it's going to be a little different than, than previous drafts. Yeah, it will be. And, you know, you still have the super seniors. You know, I'm looking at yeah. some of these guys, and uh, I tweeted out a comment about, uh, Hen and Hooker, and it wasn't until the day that I discovered that he was a super senior, a six-year guy. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when you talk about, like, people are chasing the Brock Purdy's of the world, some of the Kenny Pickett's of the world, guys that have significant experience at that level, well, it's an advantage when you've been in college for six years and you fully not only matured physically, but mentally you've seen a lot of things through your practice reps and game reps. Um, and that applies for a lot of guys, not just the quarterbacks, but the position players. The more reps that you get in this game, uh, it certainly helps you develop a, an expertise and a mastery of it. Now, it may limit some of the upside 
And so when you're a scout, you have to kind of balance that, hey, what they are now, how much more is left yeah. in them to develop. But, you know, man, we try and make it where it's not hard. Like whatever they do in college, that's what they're going to do in the pros. Don't count on them being uh, much better in the pros because it's a harder game with more experienced people. But uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun spring when we talk about all these players. No doubt. Um, all right, we're going to jump in and talk about how these two Super Bowl teams were built and maybe some lessons that we can take from it. Uh, always mention the fact that it is a copycat league, and that's not just with players. Um, that's with team building and seeing what works and seeing what we can learn from it. So uh, I figure we'll start here with the Kansas City Chiefs and a couple nuggets on them, and then we'll jump into your takeaways, and, and I'll give you mine. Um, 15 starters on their roster drafted by the team. Um, in this last free agent group, they signed Juju and Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Um, 36 players on the roster have been acquired since 2021. Um, so those are some of the quick little nuggets there, Buck. And as we look at this chart and kind of look at how this team was put together, what jumps out to you? Well, I mean, the number one thing you said there, DJ, 15 drafted players in the starting lineup, whether you call it 22 or 23, depending on the nickel, um, that's significant. I mean, it's significant in terms of we always talk about the best way to build your team is draft and develop. And so you got to tip your hat uh, to Brett Veach and company for identifying the players. You got to tip your hat to Andy Reid and company for developing those players and for the two factions in the organization being in lockstep in terms of what the vision of the team is, going and get players to fit the vision of the team and then making sure you give the young guys opportunity. So the homegrown nature of the team to me stands out. The other thing has been we talk about the draft and how the draft is a vehicle that you have to really crush to be able to pay a quarterback significant money. So Patrick Mahomes has been paid his big deal. And so he, he's in, in that whatever deal, that monster deal that he signed a couple of years ago. Well, then I look up DJ and I look at what the Chiefs did last year in the draft. Look yeah. at their defense and the amount of um, production they are getting from their rookies. DJ in the secondary. I like to highlight the secondary because my high school team. That's your guy. That's your them. guy. That's my guy. So I like, I like, I like to give him a little credit considering he was a linebacker in, in high school and I don't know where he became a DB expert, but he's done a really good job. <laughs> DJ, in the AFC championship game, they had four guys in the rotation that were rookies playing. I mean, right from college to being able to play significant um, minutes and to think about what they did. They do what is always the, the, the hard conversation to have in the office. Hey, man, we're going to draft these young players, but you got to put them on the field. It's hard for coaches to put young guys on the field. The Kansas City Chiefs not only put them on the field, but they stuck with them while they were going through their groin pains. And now you look up, this team is in the Super Bowl with a young secondary that will be able to compliment Patrick Mahomes for years to come. And you would like to think, they're only getting better because they're only scratching the surface on what they could be as players. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you on this stuff, and I think a lot of it is development, is coaching. I give coaching tremendous amount of credit here. I think that's kind of the missing ingredient when you're thinking about championship teams is do we have good teachers? Do we have coaches that can develop these guys? And when you look over the last two drafts, They've got eight starters, not to mention all a whole host of contributors. But you go to the 2021 draft, Nick Bolton in round two has is, is really been a star for them. Creed Humphrey, one of the best centers in the NFL. Both those guys uh, showing up there in the second round. Um, you go to Noah Gray in the fifth round, the tight end. Trey Smith was a unique situation because – you know, because of medical concerns, he had fallen all the way to the sixth round. He was a first-round caliber player, and it's been one of the best guards in the NFL. They get him in the sixth round. So that's 2021. Just the draft, not talking free agency. Then you go to this year. Trent McDuffie and George Karloffis, they're two ones, uh, plug-and-play guys. You look at the two seventh-rounders, Jalen Watson and Isaiah Pacheco, um, guys with big upside with traits that they that they hit, hit on there in round number seven. Then a whole host of other contributors, from Sky Moore uh, to uh, Brian Cook, the safety, Joshua Williams, who we've seen a lot of. I mean, these guys are playing uh, significant roles for this team. So we always talked about to flip a team. like, And they didn't need to be flipped. They were already an elite team, but mm -hmm. they flipped the roster. And if you go back and look at Super Bowl teams, it's a fun exercise to do. Usually you can identify the one or two drafts. It takes about it takes two drafts of getting three to four starters 
to build a championship caliber roster. And you can do it almost every year. You go, oh, that was the one. Okay, that, they got this guy mm-hmm. and that guy. Okay, that that makes sense. And this literally has happened in the last two years. And I think the point that you made when you're paying your quarterback that much money, not only is it important that you hit on your top picks, it's important that you land some starters in those middle round picks. So when you see guys going in round five, six, seven, mm-hmm. um, just in the last two drafts, Buck, that's one, two, that's four starters they've got from the fifth round to the seventh round. That's good scouting. And, and that's that's that whole staff. And give Brett a lot of credit for that. But they've built a great staff. Um, and then we can, you know, we'll transition and talk to the free agent stuff and the trades as well. It hasn't just been the draft, but that, those last two drafts as good as anybody. As good as anybody. And I think it's, un, it's important for listeners to understand when we talk about uh, the fourth round or later, what we're talking about is developmental players. When we go to the verbiage that is attached to our reports, when you put a fourth, fifth, sixth or seventh round grade on a player, you're saying he's a special teams contributor and he's a developmental player who's going to have to work to be a guy that can not only get into rotation, but eventually start. So for the Kansas City Chiefs to have four guys that have come from um, that pond, that is talking about not only have they identified guys who had the correct potential, like they correctly identified guys who had potential to be starters, they developed them and put them in situations where they could earn the right to play. That is uncommon. A lot of times we talk about, hey, you find a start in the fifth, sixth, seventh round. A lot of times that's luck you know, and happenstance. But this appears to be more of a crafted plan where they're saying we can take these guys, they fit a certain profile, and we have a proven system to get those guys on the field and to not only get them on the field, but to get them playing well. It's a combination of the front office and the coaching staff working in concert to make sure that they have the right guys uh, on the board and they get the right guys kind of in the basket when it comes time to pick them. So see if you're with me on this because you know we haven't talked about obviously the the elephant in the room being the, uh, the the best player in the NFL and Patrick Mahomes and that was you know we've talked about it a bunch in the mm. past how they nailed that evaluation but I had this thought when I was just thinking about the Kansas City Chiefs and it, it's an example I think for the rest of the league that a you can't be scared um, in mm. in your evaluations they they identified Mahomes they were bold they went up and got mm. him um, and they and they made that happen I would say this Buck if you're building a team and you have to you have to come to grips with with this question is your goal and why you're doing this to be a consistent 500 or above team or is your goal to win a championship because when you look at the landscape of the quarterbacks in this league right now if you don't have a quarterback with that upside like if you're just trying to get a steady Mm -hmm. eddie game manager quarterback Mm -hmm. man it's going to be hard to win a championship so i almost I almost think the philosophy should be, hey, hopefully you have a patient owner. You know, everybody has that. But you're better off betting on somebody with the upside who might not be there yet, but knowing one day he could be an A-level player because I'm going to need an A-level quarterback with the way the league is set up right now. And then what that allows you to do is what Ozzy would always say is, hey, we're looking for doubles everywhere else. Like once we get the, once you hit on the quarterback who's got an A-level quarterback, I don't need to swing for the fences anymore. Everybody else around him, like Trent McDuffie, that's a high floor player. George Karloftis, high floor player. Like those are the types of guys you're bringing in to surround around your A-level quarterback. But, you know, just taking it, taking a, you know, gosh, this quarterback's just okay. And we got to put all these other pieces around him. That's a lot harder way to do it, man. It is a lot harder way to do it. And I think everyone will look at the San Francisco 49ers as the model for being able to do it that way. They have gone in reverse and they found a way to put um, the A plus supporting cast around the quarterback that you kind of drop in that's more the managerial type. Uh, when you look around, and I, and I think it's really important uh, to do this, the, the quarterback evaluation, not only in the draft, but uh, when it comes time to re-sign the quarterback, you have to be very, very honest in terms of what that quarterback is. And if you pay, if you overpay for the quarterback, then it really limits you because you're paying playmaker money for game manager plus and that's not going to be able to do it because you're not gonna be able to surround them with enough um firepower to be able to play at a high level offensively however if you gamble on the playmaker uh what you're doing is you're looking at physical traits you're looking at tools you're looking at um the the superpowers that potentially could make them an a level player in this league and so it may look differently your draft board may look different than others because you're looking at the toolsy stuff. So that would mean like 
the Josh Allen type would be your model where, hey, it might not have looked great in college, but here's what he is. Size, mm-hmm. arm talent, athleticism, playmaking ability, and you'll live with some of the warts as opposed to a give me the perfect quarterback that spins it right, that plays the game perfectly from the pocket, but maybe he is deficient Limited. when it comes to some of the arm talent, big play ability where you can do it inside and outside the pocket. And fan bases have to um, get on this. And I'm going to say this, and, and look, I guess I, I mean, I, I had a great conversation with Jim Caldwell over the weekend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was uh, at Pro Bowl stuff and bumped into him. We were talking about quarterbacks or whatever. And he said this, and I thought about it. He said, you know, you almost have to look at this like it's college. Whereas instead of thinking about that 10-year, 15-year window, maybe mm-hmm. that window's five years for the quarterback. And maybe mm-hmm. you treat it like college where we've talked about graduation, where you look at the guy because it's been proven, DJ, time and time again, the, the player on the rookie contract, He's the most valuable because it allows you to build up the rest of the team. And so as we're looking at these quarterbacks, maybe that position becomes a little more transient every five, six years in terms of who we're plugging and playing in that spot until we get the Pat Mahomes guy. You know, yeah. we just keep yeah. turning it over. Yeah, there's, there's eight, we don't worry there's about eight, the outside those, noise. You know, there's seven or eight of those that aren't going anywhere. You're going to pay them the 50 and just say, hey, they're good enough. We can we can make it work around them. But the danger is going to be when retreat. you get the guy that's below that and you give him that second deal. That's going to be the danger. And so it requires discipline. But can we stick to the thing that, hey, we appreciate you, but guess what? We're going to draft another one to see if he can take it from where he took it and carry it a little yeah. farther. All right, real quick, last thing on the Chiefs, then we'll move on. If you look at the trades that they've made, mm-hmm. you're going to be bold. You're going to make a trade Frank Clark, pass rusher, Orlando Brown, tackle. So if you're going to go with the veteran route and make a trade, you're going for a premier player, premier position. That's kind of been their philosophy. Look, DJ, a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about when it comes to team building, it is about the premier positions. And we talked about those things, those positions really haven't changed. We talk about quarterback, a handful of playmakers on the perimeter, whether it's a wide receiver or a tight end. Uh, we talk about the tackle positions. Defensively, we talk about pass rusher. Uh, we still are in that debate about uh, cornerback, safety, which one's more more valuable in terms of what system you play defensively. And then someone on the second level at linebacker has to be a playmaker, whether it's Mike, whether it's a Will, whether, you know, we talk about the off the ball linebackers. But you have to have some of these premier players. And sometimes those guys need to be uh, ready made, plug and play. Yeah. Great. They're five, six-year veterans. They played. They they kind of worked through the kinks. Now they're ready to play at a high level. Well, we'll pay a premium for that because they're in a premium spot, and we need prime performance from those guys in those spots. Yeah, no doubt. Well, they're, they're, that's a look there at the uh, Kansas City Chiefs and how they were built. Uh, free agency, we mentioned that with the wide receivers, Juju and, Mar- and MVS. You go to Joe Tooney in 21 was a great signing. Um, so, anyways, that's a that's a look there at the Kansas City Chiefs. A little different uh, in terms of how the teams were built when we flip over to the NFC and the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll dig into that right after this break. Let's jump into the NFC here. The Philadelphia Eagles who, well, let's start with this question first as we look at how they were built. My opinion, I think it's the best roster in the NFL right now, depth-wise, in terms of mm-hmm. talent, top mm-hmm. to bottom. Are you are you uh, are you seeing that the same way? I uh, mean, I think they are built the right way, and because you have like a lot of experience having worked there, you kind of understand how the building thinks, how they operate. And DJ, I think is is, I mean, like, look, it's a great job in terms of like their philosophy in terms of building the team. They build it from uh, the foundation, offensive and defensive lines. And then they figure it out. Uh, the number of early picks, first round picks, uh, money they've committed to the offensive and defensive lines, to me, suggests that, hey, it's about the front guys. Then it's about the back guys. And when you look at the success that they've had offensively and defensively, it's driven by the guys in the trenches. And so we talk about this game and everyone loves to talk about it being a passing league or whatever. But at the end of the day, this is a combative league that is decided by the people in the trenches. And when you have better people in the trenches, your team wins. You not only win, you dominate. In the Eagles run, we can talk about people saying they had the easy road. But in those games, 
you felt their dominance up front offensively mm-hmm. and defensively. And so um, they bullied the bullies in the San Francisco 49ers, regardless of the, the, the injuries, they bullied the bullies. And that is what it requires to be able to be a team that is not only uh, going to the Super Bowl one year, but you're talking about a team that is going to consistently be in the conversation is because you have dominant people up front. Yeah, and we look at some of the notes here um, and get into some of the thoughts on it. 52 players on their roster have been acquired since 2018. Um, Jalen Hurts, you juxtapose his number, his cap number versus Patrick Mahomes. I mean, he's in year three of his rookie deal. His cap hit is 1.64 million. Um, so they're in they're in a different spot there uh, than uh, than their counterparts in the Super Bowl, the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I would just say they have hard fast rules um, that they have followed forever. Like linebackers, you know, running backs, they're not taking them in the first round. They just they they were kind of ahead of the curve, maybe a little bit on that um, mm-hmm. in terms of line of scrimmage and playmakers. That's it. That's what they're looking for, line of scrimmage and playmakers. And when you look at some of these ones, look at some of their starters, Fletcher Cox, Lane Johnson. Um, you can go all the way down through, um, uh, let's see, Landon Dickerson was a two. This year, last year, Jordan Davis. Like they are, they're, they're getting their bigs in the first round. And then they've been able to hit on running backs in round two, tight ends in round two, um, still continuing to sprinkle other uh, – you know, bigs in the mix as you go through the middle rounds, hitting on a guy. You know, obviously Jordan Mailata was a huge one, hitting on him in the seventh round, Kelsey in the sixth round. Like they've been able to keep going and investing in the line of scrimmage throughout the draft. Um, that's been a key part of it. And then I think when you look at, you know, from a free agency and, and a trade standpoint, Howie Roseman's always going to use every avenue. He's never going to be just limited to uh, to what you can do in the draft. So if you just look in this last off season, what he accomplished. He uh, signed in free agency. Bradbury, Hassan Reddick, who's you know second in the league in sacks. Uh, Linval Joseph. Um, you look at the trades, the big trades for A.J. Brown, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. Those guys are all starters, plus a whole host of other contributors they've acquired via free agency. And then, uh, obviously, Robert Quinn is another trade there as well. Um, but using every avenue you can to uh, to attack your roster, something that Howie does. He does it better than anybody else in the league. I, I don't even think it's close in terms of creativity of, of bringing in talent. Yeah, I mean, he, look, he, he is not scared uh, to make moves. He's not scared to move off of players that aren't there. The thing that he did with Carson Wentz, to me, uh, showed his, his shrewdness, uh, his ability to understand exactly what it is and when you need to move off of a player. A lot of player, a lot of executives would not have moved off of Carson Wentz when that situation was there. You paid him. He was your franchise quarterback. You celebrate him as a franchise quarterback. But then when it became obvious that maybe the other guy, the young guy, had kind of commanded the room and showed enough promise, they made the move. Everybody yeah. doesn't do that. And so he deserves a lot of credit for that. And look, he had to eat a lot of it when people t- kind of snickered and laughed about the quarterback factory, but he's been proven right. When they took Jalen, they talk about, hey, we want to kind of be the quarterback factory. And everyone's like, oh, it didn't work out. Like, look at your quarterback. Mm -hmm. Well, now they got it. And I wouldn't be surprised if they went back in the mix and continue to look at quarterbacks because it's such a valuable position. So why not? But the guy that they got in Jalen, the team that they've assembled around him, particularly up front, is one of the reasons why the Philadelphia Eagles are sitting right there in Super Bowl. And I also, you know, you talk about it being able to admit the mistake there with Carson Wentz and move on. How much he, you remember it was a punchline for them taking Jalen Rager Mm -hmm. over Justin Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Well, he fixed it. He went out and got a trade for A.J. Brown, which was an unbelievable uh, acquisition to go along with drafting Devontae Smith. So you lose out on a premier player like Justin Jefferson. He's got two. He's got two really, really good weapons there. And so it's just, hey, we made a mistake. Move on. We, we moved on from Jalen Rager. We brought in better players. Um, you look at, at the, the draft where they took uh, you know, a swing in the first round on Andre Dillard, the tackle from Washington State. I liked Andre Dillard a lot. I thought he'd be a really good player. Yeah. He was a really good pass protector mm-hmm. at Washington State. It didn't work. Um, so that's fine. We'll just, keep, we'll just keep going back to the well. And we don't feel like we need to run him out there as a starter either. Hey, if you're not good nope. enough to play, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll pay Jordan Mailata. We took him in the seventh round. He beat him out. We're going to pay him. Um, and he gets out in best, front of these best contracts. Best players play. Yes. Yeah. But best I, players I want you to play. think about this. Think about this. So if you look at their team, I was just looking this up. They're free agents after this year. Okay. So guys with expiring contracts, offensively, Kelsey, uh, your starting center, Samalo, your starting guard, uh, Miles Sanders, your starting running back. 
And then you go to the defensive side of the ball. Bradbury, your starter. Brandon Graham is a key contributor who's been there forever. Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave, uh, Linval Joseph, TJ Edwards has been a really good player. Chauncey Carter Johnson, he just acquired. Now I'm looking at this going, oh my gosh, look at all the guys they've got. And then you, you know what you do? You look at how you build a roster. Look at their draft class from this last year. Jordan Davis, the big defensive tackle. Cam Jurgens, mm-hmm. the center. Uh, you look at N'Kobe Dean, the linebacker. Uh, they, they've got guys in place like, okay, hey, you guys have been great for us. You've been great players. You know, Hall of, in Jason Kelsey's case, a Hall of Famer who's still playing mm-hmm. at a Hall of Fame level. But mm-hmm. if he wants to retire, guess what? Cam Jurgens, you're ready to rock and roll. Javon Hargrave, hopefully we can pay you. Hopefully we can keep you. Same with Fletcher Cox. Like maybe get another little, another little contract. If not, guess what? We got Jordan Davis. We're rocking and rolling. Like they've backstopped all these positions. There's so much planning and thought that's gone into how they've built their roster. And it's not only that. How about the way they manipulate the draft every year? How he oh, get extra picks. had a run yeah. where extra picks, and now he's sitting there with two first round yeah. picks. Yeah, and you Top know, pick. and you know, what do you do with you? Me wait, and hey, yeah, you know what? I'll trade off this second uh, mm-hmm. first round pick and make sure next year I have two first round picks. And so it goes on and on and on in terms of the flexibility to build your team by any means necessary. And that is what the Philadelphia Eagles have done. They've been able to do that. Uh, from that standpoint. But I want to make sure that we give the coaching staff credit. We give Nick Sirianni yeah. credit because yeah. I know there's a lot of conversation and hot takes about how he fell into this and it's very easy for him. No, no, no. I'm going to give him his flowers because he made a decision in the middle of last year to change the way that they played offensively and defensively. They were a team that were trying to play a certain way on offense with, with Jalen Hurts. About midway through, they switched and they really played to his strengths and the offense exploded running the football with him as a catalyst. And then you go back and you look at what they were able to do defensively. They came in with Jonathan Gannon. He was doing a lot of the Matt Eberflew stuff, read, react, keep the ball in front, a lot of zone stuff. They don't play like that anymore. And you got to pay attention. This team will get after you. They're in tag mode. They play on their toes, coming downhill. 70 sacks. 70. And so give them credit because that's what good coaches do. They may have an original plan, but when that plan isn't going according to the script, they get off of it and they find a way to play to the strengths of the players. The Philadelphia Eagles have done a great job on the front office front and also in the coaching staff in terms of making this team a a championship caliber squad. Yeah, you know, and you know, my we've we you've known this forever, but Jeremiah Washburn is one of my best friends, and Jeremiah is, is coaching their outside linebackers who've had a historical year in terms of the numbers of guys with sacks, um, and you know dealing with that front. Well, one of the other things that you have is you have somebody who is an offensive line coach who's now mm-hmm. in charge of your rush plan. So if you think about it from a baseball standpoint, you mm-hmm. have you have a hitting coach right who's going to sit there and say we're going to work on your swing where your hands are, you know, timing, all that kind of stuff. And then you have then you have somebody who studies the opponent and studies what they like to do and say, okay, now I'm going to give you an attack plan. So you have your mm-hmm. fundamentals, but then let me give you an attack plan. I think now what you're seeing with advanced organizations is they're having guys that are saying, okay, we'll, we'll work and we can do it. And, and Jeremiah can do all that stuff too. But, you know, working with the, the fundamentals and here's where your hand is, hand placement is, all this kind of stuff. But then there's other people that have a role where you can be able to say, okay, if we look at the tendencies of this quarterback, this is his sweet spot where he likes to maneuver around. We're going to close that off with our rush plan. We, this this guard has an issue with games. So when we run our stunts and games, guess what? We're going to make mm-hmm. him have to think and pass that off. It's creating a rush plan, um, not just you know the technical one-on-one stuff, but having an understanding. And when you have an offensive, a former offensive line coach working on the defensive mm-hmm. side of the ball, who sees things differently. I don't know. We talked about this in the past. Why doesn't every team, they should have an offensive line coach helping the defensive line. They should have a defensive line coach working with the offensive line because you're going to be able to see, hey, look, this is what they're going to do. I mean, if I watch our tape, self-scout, this is what you're going to see because this is what I would do if I was coaching against you. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. And DJ, I, I'm really a big believer in the cross-training the cross training of coaches, because there's certain stuff that you get when you take an offensive guy and you put him in a defensive room. He is able to tell you, hey, is this what they really think about on offense? Like if we line up in this, what is the mindset on the other side and vice versa? And it works. And so when you talk about Washburn being on that side, having a uh, an experienced background in O-line play, 
being able to take protections and attack protections because you yeah. know exactly where the vulnerabilities are. That is huge. That's next level stuff. And a lot of people talk about it and a lot of offensive and defensive coaches think they know how to attack, but it's different to have someone who has spent time on that other side of the ball and really knows what the adjustments are and what the protections and all those things are and what really gives it problems. It changes the game and it certainly has played a big role in why the Philadelphia Eagles have been able to really win with an attacking style defense that, I mean, 70 sacks is ridiculous. I don't care 15 how you more, get it. 15 more I mean, than the second time. It's 15. unbelievable yeah. to be able to do that and to do it with it limiting some of the big plays. The ball doesn't fly over their head because it's a haphazard rush plan. They have yeah. it all to coordinate it. It's been a really good job by their defensive staff. Yeah, and I think there's some other teams that do this. Uh, I think the 49ers are one that does it as well. They're attack teams. But we always talk about um, – Coverage is setting traps, right? You'll see it where they'll mm -hmm. set a trap. They'll have a corner kind of squatting on crossers. Quarterback doesn't see him. Or you're gonna you're gonna buzz down and you kind of set. You're setting traps for quarterbacks. I don't think people realize that there's ways to set traps for quarterbacks with your rush. In other words, mm -hmm. I see I'm a quarterback, and all of a sudden I see this that all opens up to me, and I okay, I can climb up in here to throw the ball, or I can take off and run. But as an offensive lineman, you're taught if somebody's leaving. Somebody's coming, all right? And so they yep. can kind of say, you know what, tendency-wise, this quarterback's comfortable. He likes to slide up into the B-gap on the left side. Like, that's where he's really comfortable. So, you know, you can set traps for them to feel like, oh, I've got I've got space in here because somebody just left there. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. Somebody else is coming in there. So I think you can set coverage traps. You can set traps uh, with your pass rush as well. I think that's kind of some next-level stuff. The, the 49ers, as I said, they do it. The Eagles do it. It's uh, It's fascinating stuff. It is fascinating stuff. And that's why when you're doing those kinds of things, that's why you need a mix of experience on your team as well. When you look at the Eagles, they're not a team that is super young all across the board. There's a mix of the young guys that are developing and some of those guys are in those backstop positions while you have the older guys still contributing as part of rotation. And they're able to parlay that experience and expertise into playmaking production. Um, you know, we, we, we continue to really go on and on about the team. But another thing that has been popularized by the Philadelphia Eagles going way back, their team that has always played a deep rotation of players on their front yeah. line. Um, yep. You know, going back to Chip Kelly and the hockey line shifts and all that other stuff, DJ, we, if you want a team that is experienced, you got to play them. They play their young players. They play 9, 10 deep on the D line. And they're unafraid to put dudes out there. They will put – those guys out there, they'll play it because they know you want to keep throwing bodies and bodies and bodies to wear down the opponent. Uh, that's been a huge part of their success. It's kind of like the secret sauce. Yeah, and I, I look at with their team in particular, let me give you a couple names to keep an eye on that they have uh, added in the mix here and what you can anticipate from seeing them on Super Bowl Sunday. When you look at Ndamukong Sue, you look at Linval mm -hmm. Joseph, and then if you, if you throw another older player there in Fletcher Cox, those three guys, right? Those three guys were premier players at at their position at one point in time in their career. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not anymore. They're older. But when you add into the fact that you're not going to have to play a ton of snaps in this game because they mm -hmm. rotate guys and keep them fresh, and you add in the fact that they've had two weeks of rest, you might get – and Brandon Graham is probably another one I would throw in there. That's mm -hmm. four veteran guys that you might see glimpses of who they were on this stage, and they only have to do it for 10 to 12 snaps, Buck. So – that ability is still tucked in there now. If they were going to have to play 50, 60 snaps, okay, the age is going to show up. You know, you, you don't think you'd, you'd like what you mm -hmm. see. But with their veteran ability and their talent and knowing the stage that they're on, I bet you see some impressive stuff from those guys in a 10 to 12 snap situation. It re reminds me of the Von Miller situation last year with the Rams, right? How he yeah. turned it on, they pick it up. Because the one thing that veterans have, the body clock. The body knows when we get into those times when it's winter go home, when the urgency is needed, and they can kind of, kind of dust it off maybe one more time uh, to do it. The other thing that you get when you get those premier players, can you ima imagine the knowledge that is shared in those film oh, sessions yeah. between yeah. them and those young guys? Can you imagine the tutorial that Jordan Davis is getting every day <laughs> when he's in the room with Indomitian Sue, Linval Joseph, and Fletcher Cox? 
and how yeah. they're talking about how to win and the variety of different things that you can do to win games. And that doesn't even include Jordan Hargraves being in that mix. But just yeah. think about the knowledge. When I was in Green Bay, Ron Wolf used to do this every year doing down the stretch. He would always sign a KGO vet who might not be able to play, but you bring him in the locker room because they understand that stage, the environment, the situation. And what it does is in the locker room, that guy is able to share some stuff that maybe coaches can't share about the moment and the opportunity and those things. You cannot underestimate what those guys are not only given as players on the field, but the behind the scenes stuff that they're given in film sessions to help their young guys, their next generation, get ready to play. Maybe not this year, but in future years when they have another opportunity to play on a stage like this. 100%. And those guys then end up getting becoming leaders and becoming good players, and then they turn around they pass it off. It, it's a machine. It's a machine. Really, both these teams have done a nice job of building the machine, and they've been able to absorb losses, you know, guys coming and going because the next wave is, is ready to go. Um, all right, well, there you go. There's a look at the Philadelphia Eagles and how they were built. We're going to take another break. When we come back, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll polish this episode off with a look back at the Senior Bowl and the East-West Shrine Bowl and what we saw from the talent on display. We'll do that right after this. All right, Buck, let's uh, let's jump back in here and uh, discuss what we saw in these All-Star games. I mentioned it at the top, we got a chance to watch you guys. Great coverage at the East-West Shrine Bowl. Um, you and Rhett were fantastic. Cynthia was there as well, the Yammer uh, doing work. It was fun <laughs> to watch you guys uh, do your thing there. Um, biggest takeaway for you from that game? Uh, what did you see? What can you, what can we learn from it? Uh, I think scouts need to really pay close attention to the tape. Uh, I think there's another James Houston somewhere in that group, meaning a late round draft pick that plays at a high level and has immediate production as a pass rusher. We talk about the premium positions, DJ. We talk about pass rushers and those things. Well, the one thing that's been proven, just in looking at the Philadelphia Eagles, you can find pass rushers at any stage of the draft. And a couple guys come to mind for me. Caleb Murphy uh, from Ferris State. DJ, I, and I've told you about the Ozzyism. Ozzy Newsom talked about pass, like sack production translates to the pros. Yep. Well, when you get 26 and a half sacks in a season, uh, that is significant. That's real. Ferris State, he had uh, 25, 26 and a half sacks, 39 tackles for loss in one season. All-time record. In any level of NCAA football, he showed up, showed out, did the same thing at the East West Shrine. B.J. Thompson from Stephen F. Austin. Um, he's in our, our friend Bruce Feldman's freak list in terms of his athleticism and those things. 6'3", 6'4", 240 pounds. Uh, is going to run sub 4'5", has a big vertical, long arms, has 16 sacks last couple of years. Sacks the quarterback again in the East West. And so when your team's looking for those guys that – kind of might fall through the cracks. Those two names are going to be names that we might continue to hear about in future years about guys who emerge as very productive pass rushers because they have that in their DNA. It's interesting you had that there at your game because the probably the biggest takeaway from the Senior Bowl was uh, you know was the combination that we had along the offensive line. I'll, I'll get to the quarterback situation in just a second. But when you look at John Michael Schmitz from Minnesota, looks like a day one starting center. Osiris Torrance from Florida is going to be probably end up being a first round pick as a guard. Mm -hmm. um, you, you look at Steve Avila from TCU, 332 pounds, can play center, can play guard, going to be a day one starter. Uh, Darnell Wright, the right tackle from Tennessee, going to be a day one starter. Bergeron from Syracuse, you know, could play inside, could play outside. He's 323 pounds. Um, he's going to be a starter. So I, I just thought that's a good group of offensive line starters that are ready to go right now. And then, you know, for a quarterback that's made the most of his opportunity, I would say probably Jake Hayner from Fresno State. Nothing about him is, is physically imposing. Um, doesn't have, you know, any, you know, trait that just screams at you. But he has a live arm. Um, he can move around a little bit with his feet, and he can make every throw. So when you look at Brock Purdy and his success, you're going to see the exact same size. You're going to see the exact type of competitiveness from him. Um, I think he could benefit from it. I, I talked to our buddy Matt Campbell the other day. I'm you know, talking about mm -hmm. a couple of his guys that were playing in the Senior Bowl, and I asked him. I said, "Hey, Brock Purdy, like, tell me wh what do you think that we all missed on that? You know, and we can debate. I don't know. We're not saying Brock Purdy's mm -hmm. going to the Hall of Fame, but he's clearly was better than being Mister Irrelevant and did not lose a game yeah. this year when he was healthy." Mm -hmm. I said, "What do we miss?" And he used a great phrase, Buck. He said, "Competitive excellence." 
And mm. I thought, okay, I said, well, tell me what you mean by that. He said competitive excellence. He said, if you look back at his background in high school, he said he was at a middle, middle tier high school, took him to a state championship. He comes to Iowa State, and he's not trashing on his own program, but look at the heights that he took Iowa State to. Like That's not a place they're accustomed to being. Mm-hmm. So you've got those two examples. And then he said his competitiveness, he showed up every day with that edge and with the competitiveness. Like Every day was ultra, ultra, ultra dialed in and ultra competitive. Like He kind of a fighter to him. And he's like, that's the consistency of doing that every day matters. And he said, that's not going to show up in a, in a drill. It's not going to show up when you, you get measured and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, you know what? Competitive excellence. And Jake Hayner, I think, has a little of that to him. You know, he's think back to the UCLA game uh, a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. He, he willed them to victory there. They've won at Fresno State in years past. That's not new. You look at the history of quarterbacks they've had there. Obviously, the Carr brothers, Dilfer, they've had, they've had guys. But I think that still, when you're Fresno State and you're beating Pac 12 teams, uh, there's something mm-hmm. to that. You know, DJ, going all the way back to when we were scouting, remember there was always something special about guys that came from Fresno. Uh, They just kind of found a way to make it and have success in the league. There's something about the toughness that you have to have to play at their program. Uh, They talk about being the team of the Valley when you look at a green V on the back of their helmet. Um, There's something to that. And the Brock Purdy example is going to be thrown out a ton in terms of teams looking for quarterbacks in the later rounds that can do what Brock Purdy was able to do, uh, come in, uh, handle a situation, manage the situation, and maybe find a way to have success. His production and play in the Senior Bowl is going to help him. Man, the Fresno State product really showed out, and it's going to help him because we're going to have that conversation. And scouts this year will be less likely to be dismissive of later round prospects. Those throwaways that maybe in the past, like, ah, he can't play. The fact that Brock Purdy has success and the fact that we had 70 plus quarterbacks played this year, you got it. You have to be, I won't say a little more lenient. But you got to be a little more imaginative on terms of, hey, this guy may have to play. How can he have success when you're reading the report to your coworkers? Yeah, no, it's a it's a great call. Um, it's something to keep an eye on. Is, is you know continue to address that quarterback position on a yearly basis. It's a it's a lesson that that your old boss Ron Wolf uh, I think taught the rest of the league, and I think it's never been more appropriate than it is right now. Um, anything else you want to add, Buck? Before we jump out of here, and again, we'll have tons of draft talk. Um, as we get through the week, probably do a little more Super Bowl stuff on our next episode. But uh, gosh, dang, man, I was looking at that date like you were the combine. And I was like, I'm doing you start doing the math, right? I'm like, look at the number of guys I need to watch. Mm-hmm. And then I look at I'm like, wait a second. That's that's coming up a little day, quicker than I thought. man. Day by day, day by Woo! day. You got to check off. You got to get a handful hey. of guys done. You got to get a number of guys done day by day. So that's done. that's a great way for us to to wrap this up, because. I don't know if anybody's listening or watching that's ever wondered where the move the six name came from. I've explained it many times. But Phil Savage, when he talked, when I worked with him in, in uh, Baltimore and he was running the scouting department, he said, "This is your first time scouting. You go out on the road. It's a lot of reports you've got to keep track of. We're not going to look over your shoulder." But he said, "The important thing is every day just move the sticks. Just get a little bit <laughs> done every day. If you just keep getting a little bit done every day, get first downs, not touchdowns, but just make progress every day. By the time we get to the end of the fall." You'll be okay. You'll you'll be on track. You'll get it done. But that's got to be the mindset. Move the sticks. That's uh, that's where we have the name of the I show here. I didn't. I, I I didn't know that. I, that's yeah, the first that time that you shared it. I, yeah. Don't I tell anybody because I don't want to have to cut Phil on any of the on any of the, <laughs> the, the sweet sweet move the sticks business that we've got uh, rolling here. Uh, anyways, hope you guys have enjoyed it. We'll be back again this week, and we'll look uh, continue to look at the Super Bowl. Appreciate you hanging with us. We'll see you next time right here on Move the Sticks.